Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Greg DeFelice. I'm from the Hospital for Special Surgery for, from New York City. I want to talk to you about my uh, concept of uh, repairing the ACL. Some of you might uh, have had experience with that back in the uh, late 80s and 90s, but it was pretty much abandoned. Um, some of you may have heard some of my work on this. I have a few talks today and a, a surgical presentation uh, from the cadaver workshop. And what I'd like to do is kind of present in this talk just a little bit of the background, and then I'll get more into the current research that we've done in my next talk, and then you can see it done in the lab. <clears throat> so uh, in 2012, I asked you to change your focus, see if you could see things differently and think about the ACL a little bit differently. Consider the possibilities that maybe, just maybe, the historic literature was biased and flawed, that maybe certain ACL tears could be repaired successfully, that with modern day advances, we could preoperatively identify the proximal tears with a chance to heal using MRI, and that with arthroscopic techniques and appropriate patient selection, success could be possible. This is a patient of mine who's six days status post ACL primary repair, um, and you can see she's doing pretty well. On the left there, she's walking, no brace, no limp. On the right, she has full range motion, no swelling, no pain, and a negative Lachman. She uh, took pain meds for one day. How about the young people? Here's a, a young gymnast. She's seven weeks after ACL primary repair. You can see how well she's moving. Her therapist really didn't know why she kept coming back to therapy. She really pushed me to go back to, uh, to sport, and at three months she told me that she was going back to tumbling because they had a national championship coming up in her cheer program. Uh, which they came in second place in the nation, and she was the girl in the front doing the long tumbling run uh, at five months post-op. So I think the tide is turning. Uh, some of you may have heard some of, the, um, of this talk before. Some of you have heard the concept, and you maybe hopefully you're starting to scratch your head and say, maybe that guy isn't so crazy. Maybe we can repair some of these things. Uh, certainly a lot more people have been contacting me, telling me that they've tried them and with good success, and uh, more and more the conversation is uh, going towards preserving the ACL. So the goals of my talk to, is to uh, share with you why I decided to try it again, how I do it, and my evolution to an, in the internal brace technique, and some of my outcomes. Why bother? We currently use a one-size-fits-all approach with the main variables tending to be graft and fixation choices. You determine whether the person is worthy of a reconstruction based on their fitness and activities, and then you give them a reconstruction. Reconstruction outcomes are variable, and they range from 80 to 95%, depending on how you define success. And this is despite 30 years of technological advances and improved anatomic understanding. Recent return to play and arthritis statistics are downright sobering. And, and as we all know from doing these surgeries, they're not that easy to get through. Current reconstructive approaches are ablative, resect most, if not all, of the native blood supply and nerve endings, and they burn significant bridges when they fail. The patient on the lower right was 26 years old when he presented to me. He had three failed ACL reconstructions and essentially uh, was bordering on needing a knee replacement at that point. And ultimately, I got sick of resecting this. We've all been in on this ACL where you stick the scope in and have a look at it, and it looks pretty good, and then you pull it right off the wall, at which point most of us will take the uh, shaver and resect the entire ligament because that dead piece of tissue that we put in there is definitely going to be better than the native one. I, a lot of my work is based off of Sherman's landmark paper in 1989, right in the beginning of the 90s. He was considered the landmark paper on ACL repair. He looked at 50 patients using open ACL techniques with the Marshall technique, and he, but he did an exhaustive covariate analysis looking at tear type and tissue quality and said that you can't routinely do this procedure. It's, it's not that predictable. However, in the proximal tears, they did well. And what's interesting, and I'll share some of my data in the next talk, is that there's a, there was a bunch of papers actually in the foreign literature, this one by Zhenlin in Kista, that actually looked at only proximal tears at five to seven year follow-up and showed pretty much excellent results. But nobody really uh, quoted these papers because at, at that point when this came out, everyone had moved on to reconstruction. So what if we could identify the injuries most likely to benefit from repair? What if we had a state-of-the-art way of repairing it if it was strong enough to allow early motion and we had all the modern day rehabilitative understanding to avoid the prior pitfalls of a mobilization. 
So a few years back, I described uh, arthroscopic ACL repair using suture anchors, and the Arthrex uh, team uh, put this out this uh, manual. In it, I discuss about choosing wild, wisely who you do the, the repair on. These are proximal tears. You don't want to do it on the lower image, where it's a mid-substance and it's pretty much shredded. We know there's lots of healing potential when you put soft tissue against bleeding bone. And this is a video of uh, letting the, the pressure down after the ligament was repaired. Really, it's a rotator cuff repair in the knee if you turn your head sideways and close one eye. Um, it's, and it is, uh, we did a study that's going to be published shortly in uh, the knee with six match pair cadaver knees where we simulated a proximal tear. We did repairs through drill holes on one set and repairs through suture anchors on the other. And then we simulated active quadriceps extension so I could feel comfortable in having the patients do active range of motion immediately. Then we measured the gap on the wall using high definition photography after 50, uh, uh, 5, 50, and 100 cycles. What we found was there was essentially no difference between the two techniques. So there's a lot of ways you can skin this cat. But more importantly, after uh, cycling the knee with active, simulated active range of motion, there was less than one millimeter gap, which is certainly uh, something that you could overcome with, uh, with some clotting. Here's exactly how I do it, and we'll do this in the lab a little later. This is a 40-year-old black belt with a uh, classic type 1 tear. You can see here using the scorpion suture passer, we're going to pass a locking stitch almost in banal type fashion into the anteromedial bundle. And I go back and forth. One of the things you have to be careful about doing is avoiding transecting your previously placed stitch. And you can't tug really hard on this because sometimes you'll splay out the ligament like a blooming onion. So you can see here as we come up, we're going to try and exit with the sutures against the wall so that when we put the anchor in, it lays the tissue down against the wall nicely. There's the first uh, set of sutures that's in, and now I've placed the second set um, that you can see there in blue. We're going to show the first anchor going in here. This is a vented 4.75 biocomposite swivel lock and you can restore the anatomy right back to where it came from. I use two anchors to spread the footprint out. There's two bundles, and I use one anchor for each bundle. I place the first one in nine, at 90, and then the second one with the knee further up in flexion. You can see here it's restored anatomically. This patient is about four years out, recovered very quickly, and never looked back. You can see the technique in uh, arthroscopy techniques and also at the Arthrex website. So go basing off of these three papers, uh, two by Seitz and one by Murray, where they show that if you, re if you did the repair and placed an internal strut, that you had better biomechanical and histologic healing properties, I evolved this technique to include an internal brace. And I used the internal brace mostly on the, the more high, uh, high ath uh, level athletes. Excuse me. You can see here we've already put a stitch in. I usually uh, put put the stitches in first, and then I'll put a micro suture lasso up so that I can retrieve my fiber tape, which is, which is preloaded into the top anchor. You'll see here retrieving the nitinol wire, and in uh, just a moment, you can see that we're going to place the anchor, and then I'll pull, use the wire to pull the tape distally. We're going to do this in the lab a little later today, and you see it's, it's not really uh, very difficult to do, and what it does is it provides a nice check rein in there that protects the tissue while it's healing. I've used this on about half of my patients uh, at this point. You can see there, and it, it runs a nice strut right along it. I did have to take it out on one patient who was having pain towards the distal anchor on the tibia, but otherwise we really haven't had any issues with it. Rehabilitation is usually uh, extremely quick. We focus mainly on edema control uh, in the beginning, in the first month, which is just early weight bearing. Most of my patients take pain meds for about a day or two. They have full range of motion within a week, and they're walking and feel pretty much normal at about two to three weeks out. A lot of them begin running four to six weeks, and I've had uh, multiple patients go back to contact sports at three months out. In the beginning, that was because they told me they were going to, and uh, obviously I was very nervous about that, but we haven't had any issues uh, with them failing. The patient there that I'm examining is uh, one month out, and you can see his knee is nice and supple, and he's got a great endpoint. Because we don't knock them down as far with the initial surgery, 
the rehab is actually rather easy and uh, they feel quite good very early. Results to date, I've done over 60 cases thus far. All of them are MRI and scope confirmed type one tears. First 15, I did primary suture anchors, and then I uh, started doing the internal brace. Currently, I've backed off the internal brace a little bit for uh, some of the older patients, just because you don't have to make the second incision, and if they have perfect tissue, it's a, it's a rather easy win. We're running at about 90% clinical success rate. We had one early failure in the original group and four late re-injuries, no complications, and three recon re-ops. So we published this in November 2015. I'll briefly skirt through this. Um, retrospective review, 100% follow-up on the first 11 patients. And um, 10 males, one female, average age 37, and minimal uh, sporting etiologies, but minimal associated injuries. Average delay to surgery was 39 days. The scores here are uh, summarized and uh, can be synopsized by saying the patients did extremely well. Notables were the single failure was doing well when he felt a pop at three months on the stairs and that his stability exam deteriorated. He elected to treat it conservatively with activity modification. My suspicion is, is that I tacked it a little bit in the wrong spot because it was one of our very early cases and that it was seeing undue load when he flexed and it just popped on him. The lowest clinical score is a 50-year-old yoga instructor who was one of two patients with an MCL injury. She was perfectly stable, but she lost five degrees in deep flexion, and this affected her yoga, and she was mad, a, mad as a hornet about it. Two rugby players returned to full contact three and four months post-op without incidents. They're both uh, three to five years out now and have had hits strong enough to, to uh, tear their MCL, but the ACL held. Average delay to surgery is 39 days. Perhaps it's not the acuity of the repair that matters, but the length and the quality of the tissue. And I'll share with you in my next uh, talk about a patient who uh, was 10 years after ACL tear, we were able to repair it and get him a stable knee. So in conclusion, uh, in retrospect, ACL repair was a concept that was prematurely discarded based upon the flawed studies of the time, in my opinion. By re re rebalancing the risk-reward curve with an arthroscopic approach using modern-day technology, on only highly selected patients, ACL repair becomes a very reasonable option. Proximal tears can heal and frequently do heal to the PCL, as Nien showed us in his article in 2014. And critically important in this is that bridges are not burned with this procedure. Early mobilization solves range of motion and patellofemoral issues, and if needed, revision is analogous to a primary reconstruction. But it's something to give some thought to. If you want to learn more, you can go uh, to my website there. And I recently put up a YouTube channel sharing some of the patient experiences so that uh, people can kind of get the word out and hear about this. Thanks for your time.